for that lovely introduction. So with the lights, I cannot see you, so that's, you know, I'll be talking, hopefully, you know, you can make any expressions at me and I won't even see them. So how fast does the population of elephants decline? How far do whales travel? How many bobcats are left in the world? Or how many turtle hatchlings survive to adulthood? These are basic questions, and yet we do not know the answer to them. These are basic questions if we want to uh, do science or conservation, effectively implement conservation policy. For elephants, it's becoming particularly urgent Okay. Nope. Uh... We're not working. <laughs> the slide change part. There we go. Um, for elephants, it's becoming particularly urgent to know the number of elephants in the world. It's become, in fact, so urgent that recently the count of elephants in Africa taken more than eight million dollars in two years and produced inaccurate but reasonable estimate. That's not scalable. The other way to track animals is to put GPS collars or other collars on them. It takes about three thousand dollars per color to put one on one animal and it lasts for a few months or a year at best. Moreover, it may result in health hazards for the animal themselves, in fact, being fatal. So how do we answer all these questions? How do we provide information for actionable science and conservation? One of the most abundant, readily, readily available source of information about animals, and pretty much everything else in the world, recently are pictures. These pictures are coming from citizen scientists, from scientists, field assistants, drone, camera traps, and in fact tourists and uh, Flickr and Instagram and YouTube and everywhere else, uh, from whale watchers to safari goers. So to leverage that information, we really need to be able to uh, not only to figure out that this is an image of an animal and it's taken from a wild animal, not from the zoo, but what kind of animal? And better yet, what kind of animal and who is it? And so that's exactly the system that we built. Uh, we can take thousands of images coming from all these sources, from, from Flickr to camera traps and drones. Ah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And to be able to, with these images, can you pull out an individual zebra from all of these pictures? Anybody? Yeah? <laughs> One or two? So we are not only be able to pull out individual zebras, but we can tell you where each zebra in the image is, and, or an elephant, or a whale. Can you see that little baby elephant right over there hiding behind the mom? Yeah. We can also tell you more than the species. So to do that, even that, we're already using, we're using, this is uh, really not working very well, I'm sorry. It's not reaching the, yeah. Um, so we're using uh, deep convolutional neural nets, so we're using deep learning to not only extract the information about what, <laughs> no, <laughs> what kind of, animals there are, where they are in the image, what is the viewpoint, what is the quality of the image, and what is typically we can get down to which animal was the photographer intended to photograph, uh, all of from, from typical off-the-shelf uh, kind of deep learning approach. Right? So we, we pull out not only the foreground and the background, but all the other information associated. But we can go further. We can ask for then a given zebra, who is it from a database of all the other zebras that, are, that, are, that we have, 
And we can say Zippy the zebra, and Joe the giraffe, and Terry the turtle, and Willie the whale. And that is not deep learning anymore. And if you're interested, you can talk a lot more why this is not a deep learning uh, program. So deep learning is not the answer to, to life, universe, and everything. Um, but what am I doing wrong with the clicker? Why is it not reaching? I think it's just he's too far away. Yeah. OK. So uh, we can do it for any stripe, spotted, wrinkled, or notched animal. And also for the, uh, we're using a different algorithm to identify individual whales from the shape of the fluke, or dolphins from the dorsal fin, the shape of the dorsal fin. So with information on when and where the image was taken, we can really now build a source of data for an individual animal, not only of who it is, but where it has been, what's its territory, uh, who it's been with, associate other biological data with it, and start really producing at scale information, how many animals are there in the population or in the species, uh, who they're with, where do they go, what's the range, what are the seasonal dynamics, and so on. So, and the birth-death dynamics. Uh, we've, built, uh, we've built about a dozen of these books one of the longest ones is the one for whale sharks. Whale sharks have spots uh, that uniquely identify each individual. And so uh, with the data that we started uh, for whale sharks, uh, contributed by the, uh, by the divers and the scientists, we augmented it also with the YouTube. We have an AI agent that scrapes the YouTube daily and pull out, we, we pull out the, the, the frames that contain a whale shark, we identify the individual, and then use natural language processing to process text and audio around the video to identify the location and time of when and where the video was taken. Um, that allowed us to scale from about initial 800 individuals to now more than 8,700. So, uh, the, it also, for all the, we show all the individuals who have seen, all the people that seen a particular individual, and that facilitates collaboration at scale that hasn't existed before. So we've grown exponentially from the inception of the database. Uh, we also, to the point where this is 10 days ago, the number of individuals, there is more, almost 40,000 sightings of whale sharks by, contributed by 5,200 citizen scientists and scientists and 134 scientists. Yesterday, that number was already 8,700. And with all the data, for the first time, uh, we are able to really enable science at a planetary scale. An article came out uh, last week that is the most comprehensive understanding of whale shark biology ever. And if you don't want to read the, sci the scientific article, you're welcome to, use, to read the New York Times version of it. Uh, that's co-authored by 38 people, authors that have never met. The only way they met was through the, uh, through the system. And using the same approach, we, uh, we deployed, the first deployment of the system was at the Lewa Conservancy, the, UNESCO, the only UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, in Kenya, it's the headquarters of the Gravy Zebra. So these are the Gravy Zebras, and they're not the ones that you're thinking about, because I know you're thinking about Serengeti and thousands of zebras with wildebeest, different ones. These guys are highly endangered. There is about 3,000, maybe less, left of, uh, left of them. And in fact, we now know the exact number. Uh, in January 2015, 16, sorry, we had the first ever full census of an entire species using people driving around for two days all over Kenya. 98% of these zebras are in Kenya, about a couple of hundred are in Ethiopia. And from local school kids to US ambassador to Kenya took more than 40,000 images of zebras. Um, we were able to identify each and single one and provide the most accurate count of the zebra species, of this zebra species in, in history, and that's, the number is 2352. And 
It was so accurate that Kenya Wildlife Service asked us to do it again this January, and we're doing it and adding uh, the reticulated giraffe to the count, which has just been declared endangered. Uh, the question is, we're getting all this biased data. We're getting data from Flickr and from uh, tourists taking pictures and from scientists and from camera traps. Each source of data is biased in a different way. So, and I'm a data scientist. So as a data scientist, my first question is, can we trust the results, the models that we're getting, the answers that we're getting on this highly biased data? So can we really count using photographs? So the answer is, yes, we can. And we can test both for the spatial consistency, for the model consistency, and for the answer consistency. Uh, in fact, and that was, that test of the bias, what finally, finally convinced both the Kenya Wildlife Service and the International Unit for Conservation of Nature, which is the official world organization that tracks the endangered status of all species, to use our numbers as the official numbers for the gravest species. We have now four species where UCN uses our numbers, including that includes whale sharks. Um, but if we're going to use Flickr images, and we are, or YouTube videos, and we are, that is a completely differently biased source of data. Do we really get anything out of that signal? Scientists, biologists, were highly skeptical of that. And so we decided to test. And the question is, how do we even estimate the bias that goes into that? So we start with the true population size, right? Um, then to even take a picture, the first source of bias is being at the right time at the right place to be able to take that picture. And then to decide to take a picture, even if you're seeing the zebra. So we found, for example, that I, I myself, I have about 10,000, more than 10,000 images of zebras. After about 2,000, I swore that I will never take another picture of zebra ever again. I've seen enough. <laughs> but then we go another set and we need another training data and whatever, and we, 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 we go and take more pictures. So when people go on a safari, they get excited, they take pictures of zebras. An hour later, they take no pictures of zebras, uh, uh, unless they're well incentivized. But when we look at pictures from Flickr, they're not well incentivized. We're, they're opportunistic. So then we, we, the next source of, of bias is deciding to actually share the images that you've taken in the first place to social media. And then we, the next source of bias is us collecting the, the data, our collecting the data uh, from the, the, the publicly available Flickr or YouTube and what we use to scrape it. And finally, which models we use to estimate the population size and all of that has to somehow be comparable to the true population size and we can evaluate the error and estimate. So we conducted an extensive um, Amazon Mechanical Turk study uh, to try to estimate the social bias. So the question, focusing on the question of what kind of images people actually share and how that bias and sharing on social media propagate how does it propagate into the estimates of the population sizes? So it's obvious that of those four images, two of them are going to be shared and two are not. But can we learn, right? Right. Clearly, this one is the one, the prime example of what is going to be shared, right? <laughs> okay. So um, the, the, we can tell, but can a computer tell? And can we tell it in more subtle cases? So we really focused on um, figuring it out. And long story, very short, is yes, we can, again. And not only it's a learnable problem, but the bias, the resulting bias, surprisingly, with all the bias that's going into deciding which picture, beautiful picture of whale or tiger or whale shark or, or turtle to share, it really does not result in the bias for the species, it's not biased by species, it's not biased by individual, and it's not biased uh, by the time of day except when it's dark or, dark or uh, light. So that's great because that's the only part that we care 
when we construct models of population size estimates. And so we did look at all of Flickr data for gravy zebras. And because we have a baseline for the 2000, January 2016 population size, we could compare our estimate year to year against that. And obviously, the further away you are from the January 2016 estimate, the higher the error. But when you compare the right day, no, not yet, <laughs> the right number, which is the estimate for the end of 2015, then our error from Flickr is less than 1%. That's insane. The fact that we can take publicly available Flickr images and produce accurate estimates of zebra population sizes, that's, we had to double check it and triple check it to make sure that that's real. So we're now expanding it to see how it actually works, for, whether it works for other species. Um, and to go from it, we've built this wild books for about, fifth, we've built about 15 of them. And we have, uh, that and together represent about 20 species. So as I mentioned, we have whale sharks and uh, some eye ring seals in Finland. That's a project with WWF. Finland, we have a couple more projects with WWF for Iberian lynx and for uh, my favorite, the Internet of Turtles, the real IoT. So it enables having that information, having images. We've shown definitely for whale sharks and for zebras, but all together allows us, by adding machine learning and data science, to do science, to do conservation, and to engage public by adoption, by really seeing where their animals going at large scale and high resolution over space, time, and individuals. And this is, of course, is a highly collaborative project. We could not have done it without the uh, many people, the four co-founders of Wildbook are computer vision scientists at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Chuck Stewart, Dr. Chuck Stewart, uh, ecologist Dan from Princeton University, Dan Rubinstein, uh, our data architect at wildme.org uh, uh, is Jason Holmberg, and I'm uh, Tanya Berger-Wolf. We have lots of graduate students that have worked on the project from computer vision to the estimating bias, and there are several master's and PhD theses that came out of it. But we really could not have done it with the uh, researchers and volunteers around the globe that, that contribute both the data and the, uh, and the science that goes into uh, understanding, really understanding the biology of all the species and the support from many, many, many organizations. I want to give a shout out to a particular one of them. Uh, that's the last one in that, um, in that uh, row. H2O, I'm happy to announce that H2O.ai uh, made a donation to support uh, our next wild book, which is for elephants, which is where this whole thing started from in the first place. So hopefully, we'll be able to recognize individual animals and uh, elephants and be able to tell you how many there are and how fast uh, does the population of elephants decline and how we can actually protect them. Thank you very much. So there, uh, the question is, how did you frame the problem as a machine learning data science problem? Did you supervise or unsupervised learning? OK, so there is no the problem. Uh, there are many, many, many machine learning and data science problem, problems in the entire system. 
some of them are pretty straightforward, the ones that are related to computer vision. Um, the next uh, sort of machine learning data science problem is given the good mark recapture, uh, given data, can we, can we test whether it is sufficiently accurate? So that we test for spatial bias. That are, there are methods uh, to, to, to compare distributions. That's an unsupervised learning model to compare distributions, spatial distributions, recapture distributions. There are models for population size estimates. We can test wh what the uncertainty is. So that's a testing model, and it's a machine learning testing model. The uh, next, the biggest probably uh, machine learning problem that was here is the bias estimate and figuring out whether population estimates are how biased they are. So we uh, so we use the the two two sided approach. One is actually trying to build models of the bias and that's using Amazon Mechanical Turk big uh, sort of designed experiments to figure out uh, just what people would uh, share on social media, which kinds of photographs, and from there building models, so that's supervised learning. But turns out that to build the population estimates models, we don't need to estimate the bias, and that's a different kind of unsupervised uh, learning. What we're not yet anywhere near is building good models for uh, spatial distribution, so the ranges, movements. Counting is the easiest problem. Going beyond counting, figuring out where do the animals go, what is the typical territory that they occupied, spatial uh, models are much, much higher, uh, much, much harder, and require much more data typically to get anywhere near accurate. So the, the next question is 0.9% accuracy from Flickr data. Previous years, uh, much larger error. So I want just to remind that we compare the every year to the number that we had for January 2016. So previous years clearly are going to be less accurate against the time point of January 2016. The closer you get in time to January 2016, the more accurate the estimates is. And that's because of a very, very, very sad fact that the population of gravy zebras is declining. How do you identify individual zebras and why is deep learning not suitable? Right, so uh, there, are many, there are a couple of reasons of why deep, it's not a deep learning problem. So the first one is that majority of, majority of individuals are seen once and that's whether it's zebras or turtles or whales. So they're seen once. And the problem is not a matching problem so we don't have training data uh, of, uh, which, which is for facial recognition, typically, you either you have two approaches, which is why deep learning is suitable. You either engineer features, and you, or you, you have good features. We know what facial recognition, uh, what features facial recognition uses typically uh, for humans, or um, you have lots of labeled data. It, uh, for zebras or for animals, uh, for animal recognition, it's not a la matching problem. We don't have labeled data for most of the animals. So from the very first image of that zebra, we have to be able to say this is a new zebra. We haven't seen it before with high confidence. And so when you do not have labeled data, when, when um, you do not have a, match, a matching problem, deep learning that typically does not work very well. You also don't have a lot of training data. Yeah. Great. Thank you.